Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Erica Jordan. I am the Assistant Vice Chancellor of Alumni Relations. Um, and it is a pleasure to welcome you today to our Admissions 101 event. It is a great pleasure for us to um, continue this series um, for our second year in a row. Um, we're really excited for our partnership that we have with admissions and hope this is um, informative. Um, just a couple of um, housekeeping items. If you have questions at, throughout the uh, event, please use the Q&A. Um, the chat feature, if you want to chat with the other parents and the alums that are on the call, we welcome you to do that. But the, the Q&A will be where we will be pulling the questions that we will answer through the, uh, the program. If you um, forget, we'll definitely will be monitoring the chat and we'll do our best to look for those answers as well. Um, we, know we, again, appreciate all of the alums and, and community members that are joining us today. Um, one thing to note is that you're, if you're ever looking for any other events or resources, uh, we do have an Anteaters Go virtual page, which you can find online if you Google UCI Alumni Association Anteaters, and Anteaters Go virtual. There's a ton of resources, um, both for your, you as an alum and for your student. Um, so I want to let you guys know that we will um, keep everyone muted because we're trying to do our best to keep sound great. But again, the Q&A and chat features will be live and ready for you to participate. Um, I am now going to pull up a um, poll, poll question just so we can get a really good sense of who's here and joining us today. The poll question is going to ask, what grade or what year is your student right now? And you can ask, answer if they're not quite in high school yet, are they a freshman, sophomore, junior, or a senior in high school? And we'll give you about a minute to reply. All right, we'll give about 20 more seconds. All right, so it looks like um, the strong majority of our attendees have a senior in high school, which is awesome, and then followed by that by a junior. So um, we definitely appreciate the sophomore freshmen and the ones that are not quite in high school yet um, for making sure you're prepared. We know there's a lot of um, questions that could you know, be on the table um, given our new times with COVID as well as the changes in the UC admissions requirements. So without further ado, um, I want to um, introduce my colleague, Dale Lehman, who is the Executive Director of Undergraduate Admissions. Um, please join me in giving him a big virtual welcome. Welcome, Dale. Thank you for joining. <clears throat> well, thanks, Erica, very much. I appreciate it. And thanks to Jessica for uh, arranging this. Um, it's great to be here again, sort of, sort of here, I guess. Um, I wanted to also mention that we have a couple of our great colleagues from admissions on us on the session with us, and that's Brian Jew, who's the director of marketing and outreach for the Office of Admissions, and um, Uma Madi Nawala, who is our, I always forget what exactly what your job title is, assistant director for first year evaluation. She's our, she's our principal evaluator for first year students. So. We are <coughs> ready to get started. <coughs> Pardon me. And um, let's go to the next screen, Brian. So we always like to start with a little bit of bragging. And I think this is pretty, pretty impressive stuff here. Um, number eight public university in the US just ticked up one notch from last year. Number one best valley. We've always been the number one cool school. I don't care what anybody says. The one that I'm really proudest of every year is the do, number one university doing the most for the American dream with some other rank, rankings in there um, that we don't have posted. Number two for social mobility in the country. But as you can see, UC Irvine has established itself as a first choice campus and established itself as a true leader in higher education now. One more, next please. Just a little bit about last year and our, our um, uh, <coughs> student success <coughs> pardon me, about 3,600, 36, almost 37,000 students total, um, 30,000 undergraduate enrollment. Of course, there's not that many physically on campus right now. 
Um, 93 year, 93 percent one year retention rate is just outstanding. We'd like to improve it, but that's outstanding. <clears throat> the four year graduation rate, graduation rate is always a little misleading because typically students take four years and a quarter to graduate. That's sort of the average for graduation. So you can see it ticks up as you get as you get longer in the time period. But these are just examples again of the of the campus being very successful and. And our students that we admit are doing very well on, on campus, and, um, and the campus is doing a great job of educating them and getting them sort of moving them on to the next step. Okay, let's talk a little bit about sort of minimum requirements. These are minimum requirements, and yes, there's a there's a paragraph here that everyone's going to ask about. Pretty darn sure. Um, these are the very minimum requirements: 3.0 GPA. This is unweighted for California residents and 3.4 for non-residents. Complete the A through G course requirements. If you're in California, your California school, I'm sure has, I have no doubt that your California school knows exactly what those A through G requirements are. We're gonna talk about them just a little bit though. But here's the big, the big, uh, the big news for requirements. I'm sure you've all heard lots of conversation or seen the paper and you know, the region's decision, and then there's been legal issues and about is UC, is UC going to be test optional? Is UC going to be test blind? Or campus is going to use the, the admissions, the SATs for admissions? So we're being very careful to just sort of say what we're going to do instead of using terms like test optional or test blind, because those words can mean different things on different campuses and can be misunderstood. So here's what, how we're going to do this. We are not going to use the SAT or ACT scores for review, selections, or scholarship determination. We are just not going to use them for those, those factors at all. We won't say we're test blind, though, because and we can talk about this a little bit later, because students who do have an SAT or ACT score after they're admitted, we can use that score to help them meet some graduation requirements, satisfy some course placement um, requirements, help meet some, uh, for example, their English, light, English language writing requirement. So we are not blind to the exam, but we are not considering it an admissions. Now, all of those things I just mentioned, um, course placement, English language writing, uh, those requirements, there are other ways for students to meet those requirements, and there are other ways to demonstrate placement, uh, their, their proficiency for class placement. So the SAT is not necessary for us to make those determinations, or not necessary for the campus to make those determinations. Um, but it is one of the options that we can use, the campus can use for, for example, very high score class in math would, would uh, help a decision for a, a school advisor to make a decision about class placement. Okay, let's move on. And I know there will be questions about that. A through G requirements, these have not changed at all. The only real difference is that because of COVID, and we'll talk about this maybe more a little bit later, because of COVID and the challenges that schools had in the spring, winter, spring, and summer terms of 2020, Students who took these courses pass, no pass, if they got a pass grade, we will still consider them as having met that A through G requirement. Essentially, the UC Office of the President, along with the faculty committees, have uh, greatly relaxed the requirements for A through G requirements. And that's true for any classes taken during this term. So it would apply to both current seniors and current juniors. Um, let's see, uh, let's go next. When we think about GPAs, this is a question that comes up. We are only considering GPAs for the 10th grade and 11th grade. And while we're talking about GPAs, I also don't want to mention that courses, if uh, a, a student received a pass grade or a no pass grade, that no pass, no pass will not figure into their GPA calculation. So a pass or no pass will not figure into a GPA calculation. 
Um, we'll still have a GPA calculation, but it will not include any course where the student took the course pass, no pass. Okay, um, let's go next. Oops, whoa, so fast. Okay, um, what we were just talking about was eligibility. Uh, that was a fast fingers, Ryan. But we were just talking about eligibility. The eligibility is the same across all UC campuses. Um, it doesn't guarantee admission to the campus of your choice. And it's about the minimum requirements to really be considered. The selection, which is really what most, mostly what we want to talk about, is varies from campus to campus, is determined by something that all campuses use called comprehensive review. Every campus has variations on the comprehensive review process. And really, students are expected to exceed the minimum requirements, both for the H through G coursework and for their GPA. And that could be that could mean they, they're taking AP courses or IB coursework, or they're taking uh, community college courses that factor in. But there's an expectation that they're you're exceeding the minimum GPA, or you're taking you're not taking any of those honors bonus um, um, types of courses, but you're you're doing very very well in your coursework, so you have a very high rate of GPA. Okay, next. Here are some numbers from last year. This is pretty spectacular, frankly. And the number that I'm most excited about is that California 72,479. We were the most popular university for Californians in the country last year. For Cali more Californians applied to UC Irvine than any other uh, university in the country, including our friends in LA or in San Diego. The, that I think is really spectacular. And I think it's a, another indication of UCI's uh, growth as a first choice campus and our popularity across the state. And it's also a tribute to our, our marketing and outreach team. Thank you, Brian, very much. Because we made a concerted effort to um, reach into other areas where we haven't particularly been um, visiting last year and get to places in, in uh, rural or removed parts of the state. And we were rewarded by that by having a very large number of applicants. Um, you see the number of admits there. You also see our out of state and international numbers. Now, I have to confess that our friends in LA actually have more appli total applications than we do because they have far more out of state and international applicants than we do, but we're working on that. That's something that we're gonna we're going to uh, continue to address. We actually did a very great, a really good job of recruiting out of state this year. Um, and then COVID came up and then it was a real challenge both for us to you know, talk to those students and also for the students from out of state to consider really moving to, to Irvine in the current situation. Um, you see some other numbers there, 29.9% of the overall rate. I think for this group, though, I think the critical number to think about is the California admit rate, which is really closer to 23%. It's actually a little under 23%. So that's a little, that's a little even more selective than the overall. Um, let's see. I'm trying to see if there's something in the chat for me right here. Um, nope. Okay. Um, you're probably, if you're answering, asking questions on the Q&A, Huma and Brian are going to try to uh, to answer most of those. So the, I, I saw a question there about GPAs for transfer students. Transfer students are, are a little different. There's no weighted GPA for transfers, but the transfer GPA is... Uh, we admit the slower, the, the transfer GPA is lower than the freshman GPA for the very fact that they're college courses, right? So this is all about first year admission summaries we see at the top there. All right, let's move on. This is a slide that is really meaningful to me and important. 
it's always surprising to me how many students apply to our top 10 majors. I guess it should be surprising because I've seen it for several years now, but 57% of freshman applicants or first year applicants apply to 10 majors. What does this mean? It means that our other 75 majors aren't getting nearly as many applicants, of course, but it also means that these majors are really, really, really selective. And we're gonna talk in the next section about comprehensive review and selection and how that sort of factors in. But let's just talk for a second about business administration. Our, our enrollment in some of these majors, in fact, in all of these majors is capped, which means that we only have a capacity for a certain number of students. So for business administration, for example, this last year, our cap was, this is kind of a soft cap, but we were, we were aiming for about 185 incoming freshmen into business administration. We wound up with about 182, so we were spot on there. To get those 182, we admitted 1,081, I think I'm saying this correctly, 1,081 students. So you can see that because we know how many students are going to accept our offer, we also have to figure how many offers we can make. So for business administration, even though, even though the campus as a whole has about a 22 to 29% admit rate for business administration, that was about 10%. So why is this really important? There are a couple of reasons this is really important. If you're applying to business administration, I strongly, strongly encourage you to have an alternate major. Most UCs don't allow a primary major, an alternate major. We allow an alternate major. So when a student is not able, not able to be admitted to their primary major because of selection, we will consider them from their alternate major. Important distinction though, important point to remember is we would not place a primary major to admit someone to their alternate major. So if you applied, for example, to mathematics and mechanical engineering, if one was your primary, one was your secondary, you have to be fairly confident about your, and, and you intend to come here, that's going to limit your, your chances realistically. It's, if you have, if you intend to <clears throat> attend UCI and you're applying to one of these very, very selective majors, it's a really good idea to also apply as an alternate major to a less selective major. And the less selective major here, it would be undeclared. Now, undeclared is a great choice for incoming first years. Undeclared is not a, you can't major in undeclared. You can't get a degree in undeclared, but you can, you can come in with an undeclared major and then the advisors in that, in that group will help you, help students either become prepared for the major that they're really looking for or help them identify a great major choice for them. So uh, the undergraduate undeclared option is a really, really great one. Um, okay, I'm, I'm seeing lots of chats and things. I'm just gonna check for a second. Huma, is there anything I need to be thinking about? No, I think you're doing okay, Dale. There's just some general okay. questions. Okay, sounds good. All right. Thank you. And one more. So comprehensive review is the process by which every UC camp, it's the process every UC campus follows to determine um, selection. And we're gonna talk a little bit about that. One, uh, a little bit now. Uh, one more, Brian, please. So what are we looking for in the admissions process once a student is eligible? We're looking for success. And by the success, we're talking about multiple measures of achievement and promise, strong grades, test scores, not the SAT test scores, but possibly AP exam scores, IB exam scores, and course selection. In other words, are students selecting courses that challenge themselves? We're looking for outstanding performance and achievement in academic areas. And we're looking for special talents, achievements, and awards. You know, somebody asked me, if, I did a radio interview just the other day, and the, they asked, well, what's the difference between LA? What's the difference between the student LA is looking for and the student we, we're looking for? And I thought, we're both looking for extraordinary students. There's no difference. We're looking for extraordinary students. 
And I always like to say, we're looking for extraordinary students who are gonna come here and then change the world. So that's, that's what we're talking about by these outstanding, um, outstanding measures of achievement and promise. Most of those you see are, are pretty quantitative. Maybe special talents could be qualitative, but the next section we're talking about is the context, more quality, more qualitative, non-numeric kind of values. So we're considering the context that each student has demonstrated or each student comes from and what they, how they've demonstrated their accomplishments in that uh, context. Now, when we talk about context, we're talking about environment. Uh, we're also talking about, and I don't mean, you know, is it smoggy where you live? I mean, we're talking about is, is, is your situation, uh, um, are you taking advantage of all of the edu educational opportunities you can or the appropriate educational opportunities you can? Um, is your, are you, are you um, addressing your challenges in, in appropriate and, and meaningful ways? And we're not just talking about how you're responding to the personal insight questions. We're talking about, you know, if, if you're in a rural community, um, Blythe, if you're in Blythe, California, you don't have as many choices to take AP exams, or you don't have as many choices to, to have the, the same kind of uh, uh, opportunities for, um, uh, shoot, business uh, internships or uh, activities with other universities or colleges. Sorry, I lost track there for just a second. Um, but if you've taken advantage of every top opportunity you have there, that's very impressive. So that's the kind of thing where we want to balance the opportunities that somebody has in, in one community or one area and the opportunities they have in another area. Does that mean that one is advantaged over the other because of their disadvantage? No, it doesn't. It means that we're taking into account the context that both of those students are, are, um, are in and how they're addressing and achieving inside that context. Okay, all right, let's go to the next one. So comprehensive review is a process that's been decided on and these are the factors that we consider. 14 different factors. Um, these are all determined by UC faculty, by the way. You can see that it's a wide variety of both numeric or quantitative. Uh, sometimes we talk about those as cognitive skills and non-cognitive skills that, that are qualitative, um, leadership, achievement, um, some other things. There's a note on here about geographic location that I always think we need to clarify. And that is that we do not give preference to students from any specific geographic location. It's a little different from the CSUs that have a local area and students in that local area get a GPA bump and uh, they have a different, different practice now uh, because they're not using SATs. So, but geographic location for us doesn't mean, oh, and, and I, we've heard this all the time. Oh, I know, I know you guys give preference to students from Uni Hill, Uni, University High School. No, that is not true. We don't give preference to any single geographic location. And thinking about it, when I think about that, it's always amazing to me how many people tell me something that they know about admissions and then they don't have that correct at all. So if, let's, let's, that I just wanted to be really clear. We do not give preference to geographic location. Okay, now let's go to the next one. Personal insight questions. Okay, so we all know what the personal insight questions. Here he goes, they, a few years ago, they replaced the personal statements and essays. We always think about these as essays. Let's go to the next one. We read these questions um, very thoroughly. We, every application is read by at least two readers, at least two readers, both, both freshmen and transfer. And we read the personal insight questions and yes, by the way, people who are asking spelling does count. <laughs> You're applying to one of the world's great research universities. There are, as I remember, eight possible questions students can choose from. Is that right, Huma? Eight or is it 12? And we ask students to respond to four of them. None of those questions are better questions to answer than the other questions. The important thing about the personal insight questions is we're asking you to, one, answer the question. 
you'd be surprised how many people start on an insight, personal insight question, and the, 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 the writing does not address what the question is asking. So it's important that the student answers the personal insight question. And it's also important that the student talks about themselves in the personal insight question. I know a lot of times it's a student might have had a really moving experience um, um, uh, watching their grandparent age. And there's a long, lengthy um, essay response, personal insight question response about their grandparent, which is great, you know, fantastic. But we're trying to admit the student. We want the student to write about themselves. Now, if, if that experience affected them in some way, that's what we want to know about, right? We want to know how the student is dealing with the, the, the challenges and opportunities that they have. And it's challenges and or opportunities. We don't expect every student to write about, you know, all these fantastic struggles that they've overcome. We don't, ex if they don't have any, we expect students to, to answer truthfully as themselves. We expect students to write the way they write. We, we sometimes see um, responses to these questions that are clearly not written by a student or the students sat down with their thesaurus and try to find every long word that they could use instead of the word that they would use. So we want the student to respond honestly, truthfully to the actual question that's asked. One of the questions we heard, and I, and I heard this asked in an earlier session that Huma was doing, her earlier presentation that Huma was doing was about, well, what about creative answers? Students are always told to stand out, that they're gonna to need to stand out in these. I think it's much more important to write as yourself. We've seen, we've seen students who choose the four personal insight questions to essentially write four chapters of a short story that don't come where close to answering the question. And they come close to telling us much about the student except for one very narrow thing. So we've seen students write, frankly, very weird things in personal insight questions. Um, we remember those, but does it help them get admitted? Frankly, it doesn't. I mean, it's, it doesn't really hurt them that much, but now I think it's even more important for students to write from their heart about what they feel and what they've done and answer the questions for themselves. Okay. All right, next slide. There are two spots for additional comment sections. Um, one, is, one is about academic history. This is really important for students to tell us about their school environment. Maybe their school grading system, if it's unusual. Maybe tell us if whether or not, if we have lots of schools where they don't off, offer AP where every, they'll say every course is an honors course here. Tell what, whatever might be really um, unusual or that we don't, might not know about the, the, the school's um, curriculum or the school's environment. That's a great, the place to put that is in the number one additional comment for academic history. The second one is after the personal insight questions. Now, this is about unusual circumstances, clarification on honors and awards. Um, speaking about honors and awards, uh, and activities, it, it, it doesn't do a student, we, and we see this in the, all the time. This was another great example I heard today. We know what volleyball is. We know what tennis is. If, it's, if the question is, tell us what this activity is, we, we know what those games are. The question is, tell us about your experience in that activity, about what, what, how, you, um, how you use that for your leadership or how you applied things that you've learned to that. To that area. Um, also, please don't use obscure acronyms that all of our readers won't know. So I, if somebody were right to say that they were principal in the CMEA, you know, something, something, most of our students, most of our readers may not know that that's the California Music Educators Association Honor Orchestra. So use words and not abbreviations when you're talking about honors and awards and activities. 
And then the last part of that is that's a great place to say anything that you didn't get a chance to say elsewhere in the application. Now, some of those are pretty limited and there, 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 there are limitations to those, but it, there seems to be enough space in there for um, students to really convey who they are in those, in that um, personal insight questions and the additional comments. So we get to all of those and I'm, we're, we're about to wrap up here and I'm, we're gonna take some more questions, but we get through all of those and then thinking again about those top majors, we're gonna have a whole bunch of students who are recommended for admission. And then we have to select from them and that's very, very difficult. And so when we're talking about GPAs and we're talking about all those kind of quantitative elements and we're talking about the personal insight questions and we're talking about the context, it's important to know that we are not separating. I mean, I, I like this quote. I, I used this quote on a in an earlier interview too. We're not separating wheat from chaff. In other words, we're going to admit about fifteen to sixteen thousand California high school high school seniors. We're not separating wheat from chaff. We're separating diamonds from diamonds. And choosing those students is really really difficult and really complicated. And so we use every one of these things as a tool to help us identify students who are going to be successful. Students are going to be extraordinary members of the UC Irvine community. And we think, I hope, students are going to, come, going to come here and then change the world when they leave. So that's really kind of what we're trying to get at when we're, we're doing selection. All right, let's go next. We have on our admissions UCI website, we have live chats. We have a chat bot that is actually fantastic that you can use at any time, day or night. And we're usually available for contact at some time, uh, eight to five phones in the afternoon right now while we're still remote. You can always uh, respond to emails. Emails take us a little while to get to because everyone is, right now we're all in, in um, um, outreach mode. So it can sometimes take us a while to respond to an email. Um, next. So that kind of gets us about to where I was hoping to be at this time. I, I know I went kind of fast. So Huma, Brian, if there's some questions you want me to, to, to get to, or if you guys want to just keep answering them by yourselves, that's great. All right, Dazzle, so this is Eric. I'm jumping back in with you. Um, so we have a couple of questions that I'll mm -hmm. throw out to you. Um, the first one is, how are homeschool grades evaluated? Hmm. You know what? I'm going to leave that to Huma because she is our freshman first year evaluation expert. Can you answer that for us, Huma? Yes, I can. Um, so for homeschooled students, um, we it, there's two different routes we see students take. Typically they will um, either be going through their district or going through a local district. And so they'll have grades um, that they have through in a transcript. And then we also see a different route where students are taking um, exams. In regards to the exams, we're waiting for the UC Office of the President to kind of give a little bit more clarity on what that um, process will look like. But if your student is being homeschooled and they're going through a district, you can definitely um, go ahead and um, have your student report those grades in the application as a normal student would. Awesome, thank you, Huma. So the next question is regarding the alternate major, is there a target acceptance rate for undeclared? There isn't. Um, that's why one of the reasons it's a very popular and um, great choice for students who, in, who want to be here. All right. Um, so let's see. Um, uh, sorry, let's see. Do you have any, well, the, there's another question in follow up to homeschool students and it's, do you have any guidance for homeschool students? I don't have any guidance for them that's any different than anyone else. I mean, we're gonna consider the context. Um, as Huma mentioned, we're still waiting on some um, information from OP about, uh, Office of the President, sorry about um, how we're going to consider exams for homeschool students. But in general, we have the same expectation that they are, you know, extraordinary, that they, they're well prepared and they're, um, 
are going to come here and change the world. I keep saying that, sorry. <laughs> No problem. Um, a question here is, um, is there any um, is there any information about omissions of children of an active duty military parent? So there isn't a, we, we want to know who those are. So that's, it's, we think it's an important part of the context of the student. So there's no specific numeric value added for that condition, but it is absolutely an important aspect of the student's context. So we want the, the applicant to write about that and to write about uh, and talk about how that might have affected them. And, uh, and it will be taken, it gives, it's given a great deal of weight in our uh, um, comprehensive review process. Okay. Um, so will first semester senior grades be considered for admissions? Um, we only consider 10th and 11th grade in GPA. Um, we consider in it in uh, selection, we consider in a comprehensive review, we consider the course, um, the, the planned coursework and the what the student is anticipating doing. But typically we don't have, we won't have senior grades when we make first year decisions. Um, we don't, there's no real way for us to you systematically get senior year grades through the application. Um, we will look at senior year grades if a student is admitted to make sure that they continue their progression through through their senior year. Okay, um, so the next question is, is it better to not report a lower SAT score or should SAT scores be reported? we're not going to consider an SAT score for admissions at all. So I, I don't really have an answer for that. If the SAT score could possibly um, satisfy the English language writing requirement, and that number is on the UCOP website um, or the SA, ACT store could, then reporting it and, and you met that score, then reporting it can help, help you in that case. Um, um, but that's an admissions issue. That's a which which English course you're placed in in your first quarter here. So it, whether you report a low SAT score or not will not will have no bearing at all on your admissions. Okay, um, and then there's a question that asks if your GPA would have been better but was frozen due to the COVID situation. Should you mention that in your additional comments? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that's that's absolutely the sort of thing that we want to know about in the in the comments. Okay, so the next question is, um, do students applying need to have letters of recommendations? We do not accept letters of recommendation. So there's no place in the, every UC campus uses the, the same application to, for students. So students, when they apply, they're filling out the same application and they're choosing which, which UCs to apply to. There's no place on the apply, apply UC for a student to submit a letter of recommendation and we don't accept them after the application. Okay, so this next question is a little longer. Um, so the question is, um, the person student, um, the high school doesn't recommend loading up on AB classes, only classes that they are interested in. Because of that, and the few AP classes available for freshmen and sophomores, he's taking his first AP classes in the junior year. Does that hurt him in that it looks like he hasn't challenged himself? No, it, it doesn't hurt him. In fact, it's, you know, we get this question a lot about, should I take another AP class or should I finish out a course sequence? It's a, it's a really tough choice for a lot of folks, but we are looking at the, the, the advice that you got about taking one that interests him is, or interests the student is really good advice. We're looking for something that we're, we're trying to get, you know, like um, a, a commitment to something. Like, are you following, um, are you following the course pattern that leads you to the major to which you're applying? A demonstrated commitment to something, right? So, for example, a student who takes takes uh, who is interested in applying to environmental science, if they take the environmental science AP course and exam, that's a strong demonstration of that commitment. They don't need to take you know. 
every AP exam and course at that school to demonstrate that. If they've taken, they take chemistry and they take their regular science curriculum and then take that, that's a good demonstration of a, of a commitment to that. Okay. So is there any weight given to students if they are, have a family member that's an alum? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, this is an important point. And I really, I think last year I made it as the very first, maybe the second sentence I said in the presentation, but by policy, we do not give additional consideration or credit in any way to alums, families, faculty, students, family members of faculty or staff, um, to donors at all. In fact, our applications are anonymized. So when readers are reading applications, they don't see the names at all. They don't, it's, it would be very, very difficult for a reader to identify somebody and somebody who was that case anyway, but the answer is no, we do not give any consideration for that or any additional consideration. Thank you, I know that's a very important question. So uh, the next question, um, since SAT and ACT scores will not be used for selection, will the scores be used for UCI specific scholarship consideration? A great question and the answer is no. We are not using the SAT or ACT for any scholarship criteria. Okay, as a follow up to that, will you have the same policy for 2022 seniors in regards to the SAT and ACT? So yes, the LP just asked us for a commitment and faculty agreed and I, you know, we were fully on board. The, we are committing to be a test blind campus until further notice, at least through 2022. Um, the regents, the UC regents made a decision to, um, their, their decision was to, to have every campus to be, allow campuses to be test optional for two years and then test blind after that time. We made the decision that we would be test blind immediately because that's what made most sense to us. So we will be also test blind in 2022. Okay. Um, so it looks like we are down to a couple questions left. So okay. is UCI anticipating more applicants or fewer because of COVID-19? Similarly, do you think admission rates will increase or decrease with these unusual times? Well, it's, so admissions rates are based on our targets from UCLP. So we get, we get a set of admission uh, target numbers that are based upon state funding and some other criteria. But basically we get the numbers from the office of the president and say, here's how many first years you should be looking to enroll. So I don't think that that number will go up. We've been over enrolled for a few years. This year we came in right smack dab on target. Well, maybe a hair under. So I'm pretty happy about that. But I don't think that that, that, will, that number will go up or down very much. But the admission rate is based on how many people apply. And that's the first part of your question. Do I anticipate more applications because of COVID? I anticipate more applications. Um, we've already been tracking the number of the number that are started uh, in on the, from UC, and the the trend is to be more than last year. Now we don't know if that's because students are at home necessarily, and so they're started on their applications sooner, or if there are just more applicants. But I anticipate the I anticipate having more applicants than last year. Okay. Does the school that the student is applying to, for example, School of Engineering, Social Sciences, etc., review the application as well? In some cases, we use an augmented review in some major in some schools to help look at. Um, the very specific applicants, applicants in that major to that specific major related to other majors. So kinda, but they, aren't, they don't do anything really different than, than uh, the rest of the readers do. What we get from, the, from the, the faculty really are, here are the things that they're looking for for that major. Here are ways to consider how a student is demonstrating proficiency and interest in that major. 
Okay, and there's another question on majors. So how mm -hmm. easy or difficult is it to declare a major at UCI? And is there a wait period? I'm assuming if, if that's if you're um, undeclared when you start. Uh, sure, it's a good, it's a great question. And really that's a, that's a function or a process that's sort of out of our office. So I don't, I know that you can't graduate as undeclared. So sooner or later, every undeclared student is going to declare a major. Um, the, the Office of Undeclared uh, Undergraduate Education does a great job in preparing students for, for, um, for other majors. But I, I can't say, and, and, and that's really, a, just really depends on which major you might be interested in. I mean, it might be easier to move from undeclared to a humanities major than undeclared to an engineering major. Um, should there be any more questions, um, please contact admissions directly. Um, as the alumni association, we don't um, have the ability to help much in that area. So again, have a great night. We really appreciate everyone's attendance. Um, and zot, zot, zot.